everyone, and welcome to the Sydney St. James Show. Hello, everyone, and we're here today with podcast episode number 10, The Making of a Detective, Vincent James Gideon, and novel one, Rosenthal, Bette Malafite de Bois, of the Gideon Detective Series. During my first 12 novels, most part, most of them were creative historical nonfiction writings. Where they were most exciting to write, it was no sooner that Mary Elizabeth Surratt died on the gallows in Book 5 of the Lincoln Assassination Series that the mystery of whether or not she was guilty really intrigued me. The Allen Pinkerton Detective Agency played an integral part for the North during the Civil War during these writings. So, as you can imagine, when I said the end at the conclusion of the fifth novel in the Lincoln Assassination series, I invented my very first detective, Vincent James Gideon of the 20th and 21st century. I got a piece of paper out and began to jot down what I thought was going to end up being a great detective series. The traditional elements of the detective story I thought should be of utmost importance, the seemingly perfect crime. Secondly, the story needed a wrongly accused person, a suspect at whom circumstantial evidence needed to point to. Ah, and let's not forget the reason for the birth of Vincent Gideon, and that is the bungling of dim-witted police. Then, like salt and pepper, we need a sprinkling of the more extraordinary powers of observation and superior mind of my soon-to-be famous detective. Then, let's sprinkle again something into the story that everyone questions. Now, as I said the title earlier, I'm sure you were sitting back saying, give me a break. (laughs) What is this title in French? Well, in this first novel, as I began to write and began to bring about this new detective, I had to call my sister-in-law, who is, by the way, a full-blooded French-Canadian. Sometimes I'm turning to my godfather in Eagle Lake for my Spanish translations when working with the Alamo and the Deleuze Rose Harris stories earlier in some of my episodes. But in the case of this detective, Vincent James Gideon, I elected to go with the French side of things. I introduced, outside the laboratory of this professor that had won the Nobel Prize, something I called in the book, The Evil Beast of the Woods. Now, now the reason that I, I had to call my sister-in-law was that I introduced another character in the book, and he was a French person, or French man, actually, and his name was Martin Dubois. Now, Martin Dubois, when he got excited, would speak in French. And when he said, the beast of the woods, he said it in French. Well, here I go back to my internet, trying to figure out how in the world do I say beast of the woods in French? Well, I picked up the phone and I called Monique and Monique says, oh, that is Bette Malafique de Bois. Now, of course, I gave it the Texas slang, you might say, because I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong. But that's how the rest of the subtitle of the book got its name. And I'm sure you were wondering that. And lastly, when developing a new detective novel, I needed to develop a startling and unexpected conclusion, much like I did in the Stormlord Trilogy series. 
in which the detective reveals how the guilty party's identity was ascertained. Detective stories frequently operate on the principle that superficially convincing evidence is ultimately irrelevant. Usually, it's always apparent that the clues from which a logical solution to the problem can be reached be fairly presented to the reader at the same time that Gideon receives him and that he or she deduced the answers to the puzzle from a logical interpretation of these clues. But now there was one other issue I needed to address. For whatever reason, I watched an earlier episode of the original Mission Impossible on television about the time of the beginning of Rosenthal, Betty Maléfique de Bois. I watched Martin Landau put on a mask and pass for someone else. Hmm. That gave me the idea of giving Vincent James Gideon, our new detective, such a trait. Somewhat like a species evolving into another, which we saw in our Stormlord trilogy series. So, I call Gideon, in this novel, the world's greatest transformist. Now, don't go looking for that word in a dictionary because you probably won't find it. But looking back, that characteristic really played out well in my first book that we're talking about today, Rosenthal, to another book that's coming up in book six called The Transformist. Obviously, I've enjoyed mysteries in crime fiction, and there's no other than the queen of detective fiction in the early 1900s, who was no other than Agatha Christie. During her lifetime, Christie wrote 66 detective novels and 14 short story collections. Her book, And Then There Were None, remains one of the best-selling books of all time. And as of 2018, the Guinness Book of World Records listed Agatha Christie as the best-selling fiction writer of all time. Christie is responsible for creating not one, but two of the most famous detectives in literary history, Hercule Perrault, And let's not forget Miss Marple. Christie created a legacy of detective novels based on gathering clues and solving the crime as if they were puzzles the reader could solve alongside the detective. Like that of Agatha Christie, that was the style of detective I was trying to produce, one that evolved into what most now call a cozy mystery. Well, let's get underway now to the real making of Rosenthal, Betty Malefique de Bois. Black Rock Cove, on the coastline of Oregon, has a unique and sinister charm. We've seen that in the Stormlord trilogy series. You know, we talked about the small fishing village as the scene of that inferno, in, I guess it was the the last uh, episode of The Three Keys to Armageddon. It's a quaint fishing village and a charming resort for summertime visitors by the day, but by the nighttime, mm -hmm, well, that's a different story. The murder of Oliver Bateman was purely the strangest of all crimes. A gunshot was heard as he fell dead out in the courtyard. But bullet holes were missing from his body. Three deep knife wounds, however, covered his chest. Well, you might find that strange, but even more bizarre, Elizabeth Knight, the daughter of the famed Nobel Prize winner William Knight, was discovered in her locked bedroom on the brink of death 
after hysterically screaming and two gunshots were heard. The door was finally broken down, and her father, Jonathan Knight, and his assistant found Lizzie all alone. There was no assassin present. As the life fluid of Lizzie Knight drained out of her in its garish red, her skin began to take on the pallor of a corpse. There was one problem, however. There was no one in the room when her father finally knocked the door off its frame. Now, find the motive of the assassin and you'll locate the criminal. Nevertheless, several people in this novel have reasons which may have led them to the deed. Which one did it? Why did the murderer leave a bloody cow bone in the room? Why was there only one bullet found in the chamber after witnesses heard two shots and two were expended in the golden twenty two caliber revolver found in the room? Also, how was the crime committed in a room where there was only one way in? through the door which Jonathan Knight broke off the door frames. How in the world did the assassin escape? What a unique way, I think, for the first novel of my detective murder series to begin. Who was killed? Now that's what you readers want to know and why he or she was murdered. How did the assassin escape? These questions run through all readers' minds as one of the most hideous crimes ever committed on the estate of a two-time Nobel Prize-winning physicist, Professor William Knight. The mystery continues as a diabolical scheme to frame an innocent man was set in motion. But wait! As you continue to read the novel, did the wrong person lose their life? What will that do? Create more questions? Well, probably it does. Result in more murders? That probably happens too. Will there be other murders? Who is the mastermind behind them all? These questions become the catalyst for a sequence of events that will rivet my readers to their seats, or at least I think so. Now, the first novel, of course, debuts our own Vincent James Gideon, a young detective making a name for himself in solving cold cases. It also involves our best-selling author, Abigail Guerin, better known as Abby throughout the novel who adds a twist of romance as she assists him. What's a good cozy mystery without a bit of that romance thrown in, right? Especially if the chief of police has eyes for the novelist as well. And then, let's not forget Martin Dubois, the Frenchman, who is secretly in love with Lizzie Knight. Now, the case must be solved before the mystery man catches the six o'clock train departing Black Rock Cove. So time is of the essence. However, no other than the great Shane Murdoch comes to town. Murdoch is Gideon's mentor and has solved more cold cases in America than anyone else. Some have even called him in headline news the Sherlock Holmes of America. He's a household name from his successful endeavors at solving crimes the local authorities can't. Now, this murder series descends into a quagmire filled with intrigue and death. I unveil a labyrinth of evil constructed by people at the highest levels of power. More secrets are revealed. Is it the 
Bete Malefique de Bois, responsible for so many deaths? More people continue to lose their lives. You don't know who can be trusted. Martin Dubois? Terence MacGyver? Chris Darnay? Or maybe even Mother Althena? Or could Gideon himself be the mastermind of these crimes? But I want to thank everybody for being here on the Sydney St. James show today. And as always, I like to present a snippet from the book just to kind of give you an idea of some of the events that take place. But before I do, I have a short little break here to talk about my favorite podcast company, Anchor FM. I'll be right back. Have you heard about Anchor.fm by Spotify? It's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Yep, Anchor has the tools that will allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And welcome back, everyone, for part two of episode 10. Back to our quick snippet from Rosenthal, Betty Malefique de Bois. Because, Mr. Johnson, we're all praying for Miss Lizzie to recover. The doctor has been with her for the last several hours, and she's lost a lot of blood. But she still lives. I understand. Very well. Tell me, what happened after midnight? Well, suddenly the Westminster clock on the end of the table by the workbench was echoing through the lab sounding the eight notes after midnight jingle. A loud and desperate outcry broke from in the room where Lizzie was sleeping. What what do you mean an outcry broke out? Explain what you heard. He stared intensely at Papa Joe, baffled. It was Miss Lizzie's voice, screaming, and she kept crying aloud, murder her. Murderer, for God's sake, help me, Father, help. It was but only a moment after hearing her shouting, the sound of a pistol shot rang out. He said in a rush of words, significantly lifting his brows, began to shake as a fearful image is built in his mind. I rushed to the door and could hear furniture being thrown all about. There was a terrible struggle taking place in her room. What what did you do then? He hesitated a moment and then continued. What happened next? Well, the screams. Oh, God, the screams, they got louder and louder. They tore through me like that of a great shard of glass. My eyes widened and my pulse quickened. I rushed over to the door and shouted, Open the door, Miss Lizzie. Open the door. Perspiration began to build on Papa Joe's forehead and ran down the side of his face. Miss Lizzie's screams had made his blood run cold. He continued, My feet felt like lead and the floor like mud, sucking me down. A glazed look of despair crossed his face as he resumed. The professor washed up beside me, Shouting excitedly, he started beating his fist on the door over and over. Tension grew on his face as he called out repeatedly, Open the door, Lizzie, open the door. What happened after you opened the door? We didn't. We didn't open the door. We couldn't. It was dead bolted from the inside. I looked at the professor and saw blood was coming from both of his fists. Didn't you have a key? Yes. The professor has one, but never uses it. He respects her privacy. 
I watched as his hands trembled. He had difficulty placing the key in the keyhole and couldn't get it to fit. The more time it took for him to get the key in the keyhole, the more anxious Professor Knight became. At last, he turned the doorknob and opened the door. He paused to catch his breath. What did you see? Drew was anxious for a response. The anxiety shown by Papa Joe had his own heart beating rapidly. Nothing but the backside of the other door. It would only open the outside lock, not the inside. His teeth began to chatter, and his body trembled. Outside? Yes, Miss Lizzie had deadbolted the other door from the inside. Whoa. Okay. Go ahead, Drew. What did you and the professor do next? Papa Joe kept talking without responding to Drew's question. Then Miss Lizzie screamed again. Murderer! Murderer! Help, father! Help! She screamed? Yes. The professor shouted again and again. I was holding my breath. For God's sake, my heart was racing like it was going to come out of my chest. He kept shouting repeatedly, but again, not getting an answer. Papa Joe, this must have been a difficult moment for the professor. What did he do? He must have been beside himself. Oh, the screams were dreadful. They tore through me like a dagger in the chest. It's hard to describe the emotions that struck our insides. My heart was pounding like a rock rattling in a box. There wasn't anything any of us could do. Drops of moisture continued to cling to his forehead. He renewed his response with true. I cried, and I cried as if my brain was being shredded from the inside. If pain could flow, it flowed out of every pore in my skin that I possess. Then again, the professor screamed Lizzie's name. But again, she didn't answer. What happened after your many attempts to get the door open? Well, the professor's face turned pale as a ghost. We threw ourselves against the massive wooden entry. The top and bottom, even the sides lay so utterly flush with the frame. There was no hope of prying it open. He paused and gulped down a drink of his water. His eyes continued to darken with pain. Even if there was a way, we had nothing to pry it with. We looked all around the lab. Nothing. So, the two of you throwing your bodies against the door couldn't budge it? No, sir, not even if we had a crowbar. As I told you, Lizzie locked the door solid from the inside. And to make matters even more complicated, it was deadbolted, too. His grief surged with each expelled breath he took. He couldn't stop the tears that were spilling from his helpless eyes. Well, that's the little snippet. You'll have to read the book to find out what happened and how they got that door open. But that's the making of Rosenthal, the first book in the Gideon Detective series. After the book has been out in the market for six months or seven, I went out and found a couple of the reviews. One was from Sean E. Jacobs, the author of Sisters of Mercy. He said, a hair-raising debut, both unsettling and addictive. A chilling thriller that will keep you reading long into the night. And then there's one from Robert J. Sanders. Suspects, hidden clues, James creates suspicion around that turnout to be distractions from the truth. Because of this, he keeps the suspense high and makes his whodunit story more unpredictable. Well, 
That's wraps for episode 10, The Making of Rosenthal, and the introduction of Private Eye Vincent James Gideon. Stay tuned for episode 11, where we find Gideon returning in Gideon Returns, A Damsel in Distress. In this 2019 release, Vincent Gideon continued his infamous skills at investigation and was in the right place at the right time. Twice. Or at least a young German woman by the name of Abigail Hoffman would tend to agree. Until we see you again. Oh, and be sure to click on the link for recording any message or questions you may have for me. I'll be releasing some of these personal notes from you in future broadcasts, so I'd really love to hear from you. Happy listening!